In the case of nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate. Hello, Sublation Magazine uh, viewers and uh, readers. Welcome to the Sublation Magazine show. Uh, this is Sublation Media's weekly live stream in which we speak with authors and discuss some of the issues of the day and their relevance to the left. I'm Douglas Lane. And I'm Ashley Frawley. Uh, and before we start, I want to ask all of you to do all the things. So, for instance, you can subscribe and you can hit the bell and uh, you can... Take a look at uh, Sublation Magazine's latest content by following us on Twitter and on Facebook. You should do that. Uh, you should consider giving us money through Patreon. It's how we, uh, it's our major line of revenue at the moment, all, although books are coming. Um, links are in the description to, well, at least to the Patreon. Also, if you're feeling so inclined, you can drop us a super chat during this show. So uh, feel free to do that if you do. I will try to see it and uh, flash your question or comment on the screen at the appropriate moment. Right now, we have a great show in which we'll be talking about the economy in the United States, but the purported reasons behind the recession and the perspective of the Marxist economist Michael Roberts. Um, after that, we'll be speaking to the Sublation Magazine author John M. Bunch about his essay, Freudo Marxism versus Psychological Reality. Bunch compares various models of the human mind, McGowan's, Lockoff's, and Hates. Um, we'll be asking him about why he chose these three people, these three models, and what he thinks of the left, or, well, what he thinks the left can learn from a centrist like Jonathan Haidt. So let's start with the recession. Ashley, you take it away from here if you can. Well, are we in a recession? <laughs> the White House claims we aren't. Um, mm -hmm. They point to various indicators to argue that the economy is still growing. And that's, that's quite interesting because as I've been saying ad nauseum for a long time, um, we were on the verge of recession back in the summer of 2019, all indicators were pointing in that direction and then suddenly it disappeared. And now it seems that you know anything that goes wrong, oh, well, it's because we shut down the economy. I have to say, by the way, my hands are pink <laughs> because <laughs> I promised my daughter I would dye her hair pink. Don't worry, it just washes out, but it doesn't wash off my hands apparently because I didn't have any gloves. So We have so caught you red-handed there. <laughs> Try not to pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah. um, but so the um, there has been this desperate attempt to try and um, shift the blame, shift focus, and then deny. And we seem to be, there must be some kind of psychological thing going on there. We're now in the denial phase. Um, so the White House points to various indicators to argue that the economy is still growing, as I said, and they define recession fairly broadly. On July 21st, 2022, the White House blog posted that a recession is a decline in economic activity spread across the whole economy and lasts more than a few months. When we consider the employment rate, consumer spending, industrial production and income levels, the economy, they say, cannot be said to be in a recession. And they predict stable growth ahead, despite what they uh, admit are some strong headwinds. However, what's missing from the White House's statement is, of course, an explanation of what drives the economy. Uh, the presumption appears to be that the economy is internally stable and that anything that goes wrong um, and the current difficulties can be understood as just resulting from external shocks. Right. Um, so I was reading uh, Michael Roberts' blog. Uh, he's a Marxist economist, um, and he's not only been predicting economic recession for several years, but he's been arguing that we're in what he calls a long depression. So in his book, The Long Depression, and in his most recent blog post, he points to one particular indicator to justify his position, and that's profitability. Profitability is a measure of profit relative to expenses. And uh, he says that while both Keynesian and Austrian models claim that interest rates and the money supply determine the health of the economy, um, for instance, the Bank of England explains how quantitative, quantitative easing works in this way, uh, QE lowers interest rates on savings and loans, and that stimulates spending in the economy. The spending will apparently include both productive investment and consumer spending. Um, but what it leaves out is what drives investment, uh, and that is profit. Um, regarding interest, uh, Marx wrote in Capital, Volume 3, that all other conditions taken as equal 
uh, assuming the proportion between interest and total profit to be more or less constant, the functioning capitalist is able to and willing to pay a higher or lower interest rate uh, directly proportional to the level of the rate of profit. So, um, I'll yeah, well, Michael Roberts explains Marx's point this way, if I could just read from his blog. <laughs> um, for the capitalist, the return on capital, whether exhibited in the interest earned on lending money or dividends from holding shares or rents from owning property, came from the surplus value appropriated from the labor of the working class and appropriated by the productive sectors of capital. Interest was only a part of that surplus value. The rate of interest would thus fluctuate between zero and the average rate of profit from capitalist production in an economy. In boom times, it would move towards the average rate of profit and in slumps, it would fall towards zero. But the decisive driver of investment would be profitability, not the interest rate. If profitability was low, then holders of money would increasingly hoard money or speculate in financial assets rather than invest in productive ones. As usual, we tend to be obsessed with the indicators and the outward appearances of things. And going back to Marx tells us to look a little bit deeper. So according to Roberts, we're currently nearly at an all time post 1945 low in profitability on productive investment. He's not the only one saying that a lot of people have made that argument. That's an argument that I've made for a very long time um, that all of the indicators show that um, there, there seems to be a crisis of profitability that's being hidden beneath bubbles and so on. And eventually the bubbles will burst. Yeah, I hope uh, we can get Michael Roberts onto the show in the weeks to come. Um, but I point out right now is that uh, profitability was down before the pandemic, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, according to many. And there was a lot of expectation of an economic crisis uh, as far back as 2019 and before. Of course, people say that Marxists predict uh, like two out of every, you know, 10 out of every two economic crises. But um, nonetheless, uh, low profitability uh, seemed to be influential uh, even in 2020 in the presidential election. Um, and you can see that in Andrew Yang's plans for universal basic income, which was meant to correct the loss of income in the working class as workers were displaced by automation. But what that leaves out is how automation also causes a decline, not just in employment, but in profitability. And uh, UBI as a solution was obviously never going to really work to address the problem, a crisis in profitability. So yeah. but, well, generally, the increase in automation um, is thought to cause unemployment, but the deeper problem of profitability tends to get missed. Um, we're going to continue to um, point to the connection between profitability and employment in future shows and clarify the economic situation and find the limits of proposed policy solutions by keeping profitability in mind. I know people hate this. <laughs> um, they, they think, oh, those economic determinists, but I will proudly say that um, I think that there is an economic, there are economic drivers to these situations and until we understand them, we will be their victims. Right, well, we got through all that talk about the recession written down for us in advance it was uh we did it was it. not <laughs> no we that was all off the top of our heads um but uh i um uh, now we get to shift gears ashley and we're gonna be talking <laughs> i should have pulled a joe biden and been like and now here are some questions for john bunch <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be good uh, and then I know, like, I think I wrote down, um, uh, I'll draft, draft some questions for John Bunch soon or something. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yes. Okay. But we do, I did write them down and John Bunch is here. John Milton Bunch or sometimes known as the Dr. Reverend John Milton Bunch. I'm going to bring him up onto the screen right now. Hey, John, look at you. Hello. Where are you? Are you in a bunker somewhere, John? Where, where okay. exactly are you located? Mm hmm yeah. Yeah. Okay. A bunker right. somewhere. Okay, that's good enough. You won't give us your location. Um, but John, you recently joined the ranks of um, Sublation Magazine uh, authors. You are uh, a now published author at Sublation Magazine. Um, your piece is called "Freudo Marxism versus Psychological Reality," yeah. and uh, we're going to be talking to you about that today. Um, but uh, just before we do, um, you have uh, some background in psychology right you have some some expertise in 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 the realm of psychology 
tell people who you are. What 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 brought you to this uh, question or this to write this piece? Well, yeah. So I um, went. Well, just to, let me give you my academic background in a nutshell version. All right. Okay. So I went ABD, which means all but dissertation, in the cognitive and neurosciences in a cognitive and neurosciences PhD program. But I left it and went back a couple of years later and finished uh, the PhD in instructional technology, which is sort of a combination. Well, for me, it was instructional psychology. So dissertation was instructional psychology. So I essentially have a PhD in instructional psychology. And uh, I uh, professionally became a started working in corporate training, developing courseware using instructional psychology, my knowledge of it to design courseware for corporate markets that teach data analytics. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I uh, did. So why did I write this piece? Because I have an interest in left politics, um, have for a, you know, lifelong interest in it. And uh, I have kind of a, could you say, be in the bonnet about, um, cognitive science and uh, its potential impact on political thinking that the, that I feel like the left needs to take seriously. So yeah, that's what you, prompted me to write the article. Yeah. You start by claiming that any political theory has to start with a theory of mind, um, which I found to be daunting as a claim. I mean, maybe you're right, but I, what I, all I have, I'm not a PhD and I'm, I'm nobody would call me doctor. Um, I don't even play one on on TV. But um, when I was in when I was an undergraduate, uh, getting a philosophy degree, uh, what I discovered was that there is no set, nothing settled around the theory of the mind. That there's just like an, a raging battle, um, and uh, so I w- wonder: do we do we have to come to a conclusion about the nature of consciousness and what and the mind? philosophically or, or scientifically before we can develop a politics or is it just a matter of choosing the one we like? Um, well, it's a good question. And uh, here's the problem, uh, sort of the way I see it. Over the past century, you know, empirical research has told us, has taught us some things about what we would call the mind, some things about the way the mind works. Uh, we don't know most of it we know very little but we do know some things and the things that we do know ought to impact how we think about uh politics how we think about goals and politics how we achieve those goals so you know it certainly there is no there's certainly no sort of a consensus about what is the mind what is consciousness and so on but uh there there is consensus around certain things and that's that's what i tried to uh sort of bring to the fore in the article ashley do you did you have something you wanted to yeah well you know me anyone who knows me will see that anytime someone says we must start with the mind i reach for my gun i (laughs) (laughs) um you know I was just thinking about this recently actually um that it occurred to me that some of the I, I can't stand because obviously my PhD was in happiness, which it was not. Obviously, I was looking at why you know policymakers became so concerned with happiness. But that means that lots of times people will want me to come and give a talk about happiness, and they want to have this philosophical discussion about happiness and so on. Like everything starts there, and it reminds me a little bit of Marx's critique of the um, classical economists, classical political economists who began everything in with Robinson Crusoe. Well, if we want to figure out where everything begins, we have to think about Robinson Crusoe alone on his de- desert island, conveniently already has a bourgeois mind and a pen <laughs> or a pencil. Um, it's the same kind of thing. We, we, I feel like if you start, I'm not saying that this is what you're arguing and, and perhaps therefore you can argue against this if you disagree with it, but it seems to me that often there's this attempt to set up psychology as this kind of, primordial terrain on which we can um, build up a theory of society. And I think this is totally wrong. And it's just as wrong as the as it was to start with Robinson Crusoe or some imagined world, because you have to start with 
the world as it is and human productive activity as it is. And this creates different ways of being human. And you can see this throughout history, right? You can see that um, people start having ex existential crises like quite late. <laughs> you didn't have an existential crisis in like the 12th century or the 9th century because you just kind of knew who you were going to be, right? You lived your parents' lives and your children's lives and all of that. So how, how can you say that everything has to begin with a theory of mind? What do you mean by that? And well, how is it different from some of these kind of vulgar ways that I've just described? That, that's a little bit misstated. I didn't say that everything has to begin with a theory of mind. So at I, the core of anything. What I said that, there, yeah, every theory or every, yeah, every political moral theory has to have some idea of mind have to set, have some idea of a thing that processes information within the individual right now that can't explain what's inside the individual by itself cannot explain broad social phenomena right so i wouldn't right. make that claim like you know uh, you said that you asked the question how could a model of mind be expanded into a broad social theory i don't know that it can so i'm not making that claim what mm -hmm. i'm saying is that uh just like anything else when there are certain you know when there are certain empirical observations that we see a lot of we have to take that into account when they come to bear on the way we think about politics now that i'm not using and let me back up a second and just talk about uh, the empirical data that I'm referring to. When you talk about a phenomenon like existential crisis, like you mentioned, right? That's not something that I would say, that's not a phenomenon that I would say, I don't think many people would say, is endemic to human psychology. I think most people would agree that the, the phenomenon of an existential crisis is it, it, there's something with individual within the individual that can express itself like that, but that it's got to have their cultural determinants that uh, or, or cultural factors, right? That that would cause that to manifest. You see what I'm saying? In other words, po certainly possible. I, I don't know the research mm -hmm. on existential crises, but I would imagine it's a very cultural sp specific thing. Like probably if you went to Eastern cultures or might not have such a thing, right? And, and certainly you can see the phenomenon of other cultures having psychological problems that we don't find in the West, right? So certainly there are cultural influences and so on that uh, come to bear. So yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it, it's, but on the other hand, you know, there there is such a thing as human nature. Um, for example, when, you know, when we, look at the stars at night we imply an order to it right we find constellations and then things like that and this is something you can demonstrate experimentally you can give people random images and things and they will apply imply uh order to it right that's human nature to do that right now what does that mean as far as politics well i don't know but it has to mean something uh about uh the way people are in the world right mm -hmm. so my point about well when i brought in well my point about the three about um lakoff hate and uh okay. Miguel, right okay so three people working from different areas um lakoff and hate both we could say are post positivist scientists right uh, but uh Lac i mean mcgowan's lacanian right he's got no claim he's got no interest in in science in being science right but they uh all three of them you know tell us something kind of similar about the mind and about how people are in the world um about the individual and nature of the individual um you know the individual is driven by emotion the individual is irrational uh you, you know and I think those are important, and they also give us clues as to in what way they are irrational and, and how they are driven by emotion. 
And, uh, you know, I think that's, those are part of the human, that's part of being human and certainly things that we have to take into account when we're thinking about politics, political theory, and so forth. I disagree that human beings are driven by emotion. They're obviously driven by the totemic influences of their ancestors. Didn't <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you could look at it that way. Well, that's like, well, that's what that's what I'm trying to say, right? Like, um, there are lots of things that people will say, and they'll say, "Well, human beings are X, Y, Z," and I just find it interesting which ones people will bring up because they tend to be the ones that allow for certain explanations of why things go wrong in our culture that are very convenient. But other right. cultures use different things, right? They'll say, well, of course, you're, you're driven by your family's clan and your your duty to your family. Obviously, that's yeah. all human beings. That, well, uh, go ahead, John. You're, Ashley, you're wanting, to, you're wanting to, to jump ahead and you're wanting to look at I, uh, examples of the interaction of external influences and the individual. And I'm trying to, st I'm step, I'm not quite stepping out to that point. What I'm talking about are psychological phenomenon that are as, as a cultural as you generally can find. Hate's work, for example, is quite um, cross cultural, and uh, a lot of his his observations, his survey, his uh, ethnographic data, and so so on, come from a lot of different cultures. And then his uh, his uh, neuroscience data also is, you know, you put any you put people from any culture into a functional MRI, and you show them a certain kind of stimulus, and you will see similar responses in their brain and their nervous system to that stimulus, right? So that has to be something prior to culture. Now the way that culture interacts with that is completely different. I mean, you know, it can interact in a lot of different ways. And the way that manifests itself, the actual behavior you see, that's going to be a result of the interaction of that person and the environment that they are in, right? So it can manifest in lots of ways. May not, you know, things that appear in one culture may not appear at all in another culture. But I want to, I, I want to interject here and say, um, one of the things that you do in your uh, article is you compare, you know, like this Freudian approach that McGowan represents to uh, cognitive uh, psychological approaches that yes. the other two uh, theorists represent. And um, the what I notice here is that while it's true that Freud presents a model of mind, um, the primary thing that he, uh, I, the way I think of his theories and his approaches to psychology is that he he um creates a category called the ego um which is like a rational the rational aspect of the human mind and the task of the freudian uh psychoanalyst is to help the patient develop uh that ego um and have that 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 ego be uh, understand its own internal processes the things that are unconscious that are prior to the development of the ego, right? That, that might be in an animal, instinctual, you know, the ego would have self-reflection. Um, this is just a, I'm, I'm not claiming that what I'm saying is exactly lining up with Freudian thought, but, but when I think about Freud, think about this notion that, you know, we have the subterranean depths and our task as people is to expose as much of those depths to the light so that we can then in a reasonable way, cope with them. Um, and uh, it seems to me that the cognitive psychologists don't entirely abandon that uh, approach, but they emphasize the um, automatic, uh, you know, irrational aspects of, of the human mind, uh, prioritize that uh, when they talk about um, and make predictive models based on, uh, on, on examining human psychology and, and human action. Um, and so I, I tend to like the Freudian approach more because it emphasizes human freedom and the uh, development of, of, of a, a kind of rationality and, and uh, a kind of a questing after better, better understanding. 
Well, it's it's two different schools of thought, right? Mm. Two different approaches to developing a model of mind, right? Mm. So, yeah. And I actually spent a long time, many years, sort of working uh, on both sides of this. So, in you've got areas of what I would call applied psychology, things like therapy, psychotherapy, things like instruction, right? And I worked professionally in both. I was worked in psychotherapy early on, but then a master's degree in clinical psychology. But uh, um, when you have an applied problem to solve, like someone comes to you and they say, I feel anxious or I feel, you know, I, I have got no hope. I feel depressed. Uh, you, you know, you have to, you know, you are in a position where you have to try to do something to improve the situation for that person. Right. So psychoanalysis developed out of that, um, you know, developed out of that, meaning that psychoanalysis developed as a model of mind that could be used to explain what, uh, you know, Freud was observing in his patients, right? Now, is there anything, is nothing wrong with that? I mean, it's a legitimate thing, right? People come to him with these problems. And I mean, the humane thing to do is to try to help people. He's come up with this kind of brilliant way of dis, of creating a model that describes how and why these problems can happen and how you might go about alleviating them. So, you know, that's an applied field. It's like instruction, right? So uh, you can go in, you know, in, in corporate training, there's, you know, th there's uh, always someone trying to sell the golden fleece of learning without pain, learning without effort. And you've got, you know, everyone coming up with their ideas about how learning and work works and so on. But, um, and, you know, and in the end, when you're developing instruction, you can rely some on science, some on what we know about the way people learn and so on, but it, we don't know that much. So a lot of what you have to do is, is, uh, you, you know, you've got to try what works. You've got to create things that work. And this is why uh, something like psycho well, this is one of the reasons, but something like psychoanalysis is simply not based on scientific observation. And the upshot of that is that it can explain anything. Uh, you know, it can explain anything with, with psychoanalysis. You can give a Lacanian analysis of anything, a movie, a book, a person comes in to see you in a therapy situation, you know, uh, the cognitive science and cognitive psychology is post-positivist science, which means that it's trying not to start with any preconceived notions about what the mind is, how it works, any of that. It tries to first uh, make observations that are replicable and all that, and then it tries to build a probabilistic model of the system, cognitive system, that can explain the observed results, right? Now, at the present time, it the models that it builds are, are, are shallow. You know, we just, you can't explain anything. I mean, you can't explain, we don't have enough scientific evidence to build anything like a Lacanian model or anything with the explanatory power of Lacan or Freud, right? There's no scientific theory of mind comes close to any of that, right? So it's, uh, so um, anyway, so, but nonetheless, the, the theory that is there is based on actual data. It's built, you know, it's based on empirical observation. So, you know, it's not, again, this isn't, 19th century logical positivism. It's not that we are claiming to have some, uh, you know, pipeline to reality so much as, as it is a probabilistic model of how things, uh, you know, how things appear to be with the idea that, well, we will likely get more data and change our mind down the road. But 
Ashley, yeah. do you want to jump in and do you have another follow up here or do or, Well, or? let me tell you why I was being difficult. <laughs> so the reason is because as we said at the beginning, um, there's this tendency to see the economy as working in equilibrium, right? And everything that goes wrong has to be understood as an external shock. And I think part of the obsession with psychology and psychological solutions and psychological forms of analysis of all these problems, not necessarily what you're talking about, but the reason why I, I, I start to say we should be careful here is because I think we bring in human irrationality in the same way we bring in like religion when we can't explain something anymore. There's a, well, why, why, why do people do this? Well, I don't know, people are stupid. <laughs> well, because people are irrational. So I use this kind of, I like to use this example that um, I'm still kind of working through, but like someone like Vilfredo Pareto, right? Um, who, who develops these equilibrium uh, models of the economy. And it's this beautiful, wonderful equilibrium, uses these complex mathematics, and everything works perfectly um, in the capitalist economy. It's a system of equilibrium. And he looks out into the world and he sees the exact opposite. <laughs> this, this, this fabled equilibrium doesn't exist in reality. And the answer is because people don't actually act rationally. And so you can, so instead of jettisoning, jettis, jettisoning his model, instead of thinking, well, maybe my model's wrong, Pareto jettisons rationality. He becomes obsessed with sociology, with psychology um, of human beings. He says, oh, we're not really rational. We're driven by all of these you know, derivations and residues and so on. And all of that is to explain why things go wrong. But the reason why I like Marxism is because it doesn't depend on that. It's easy to say, well, people must just be stupid. People must be irrational. Oh, there must be all of these things beneath the surface. Um, and it's harder to say, well, actually, people might be acting rationally. In, at the micro level, we may be acting rationally. And the question is, why does that lead to something? Why are we acting rationally? Uh, or something that is rational at the micro level leads to something totally irrational at the macro level. For me, that's the interesting question. So the reason why, like, is when, I, when I heard like, oh, we have to start with the theory of mind and we have to come up with this theory of mind and this is the thing that pre, is pre-cultural, you know, I start getting really uneasy because it's, it reminds me of, and I feel like this is a tendency on the left after we got rid of Marxism and we started to bring in um, mainstream economics. Uh, well, mainstream economics now, its whole purpose was to justify capitalism in the face and get rid of the labor theory of value. And it's even more obsessed now with um, nudge theories and this, that and human irrationality and the myth of the rational subject and the myth of homo economicus because it's trying to explain why capitalism doesn't work but marxism doesn't need that it still begins with the rational subject we do act rationally but at the aggregate level this leads to recession and crisis that's why i was being difficult <laughs> uh, okay okay I, yeah see this is the thing i mean i think the this is why for years i've tried to poke and prod at doug for being a fundamentalist marxist because I think that, um, you know, I think there are problems with that. I mean, honestly, um, you know, it's. I Can I hear you say amen, John? Say uh -huh. amen. Get get on the program. I want to save you from this. I'm with my fundamentalist Marxism. Yeah. Go on. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just that, you, you know, Marx makes assumptions about. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll give you an example. This might mm -hmm. be a more direct way of talking about this. So I'm not somebody that keeps up a lot with current leftist politics. And uh, like I was not familiar with Baskar Sankara until the past couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. uh, this weekend I read his book, The Socialist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the same just to see if there's something new that I not thought of. And it's the same thing it's the same argument and it's this assumption that a particular kind of first it's an assumption that a particular kind of democratization of the workplace can happen and that if it happened people would respond and react to it in a particular way i mean that is an assumption that's made by by you know sort of the the i guess the 
that is a, a an assumption that's made by any Marxist argument. So it's made by any argument, right? By any e economic argument or theory. So my point is, or one of my things I want to focus on is, you know, why can you really make those assumptions? Um, can you make an assumption that wh how is it you can make why can, why do you make the assumption that in general people will do the additional intellectual work it would take to democratically participate in the workplace and i'm not asking that to tell you it's not possible i'm saying that because to me that's a core issue the left has to wrestle with now I mean, from my own sort of political moral sense, I want to see a democratization of the workplace, right? But I'm fully admitting I'm coming to it from a kind of a moral perspective, and I'm not coming at it from a purely intellectual perspective. Um, so my approach is more, okay, well, if we know we have X, Y, Z as a goal, we first, you know, we've got to have some idea of is this, you know, how people, how would people respond to this in the real world? And if we think they would respond positively, then, you know, knowing what we know about people, how do we go about achieving it? Because, see, this is a, another thing, with, another thing in the, in the, in the paper. Um, the model that Lacan, Haight, and Lakoff give us is one where you've got these kind of, you know, innate or, or sort of either primordial sorts of tendencies to be different, right? Everyone has a sort of primordial tendency to be different. So some people are going to find, uh, you know, a sort of a leftist perspective appealing. Some people are going to find it horrifying. And that's just, you know, that that's there's something innate about that. Now, granted, it can be greatly manipulated by culture and by society and things like that. But uh, to me, you don't have a situation, to me, what you're going to have in the future is just a kind of constant struggle between, you know, a kind of, uh, a, a kind of, uh, you know, democratic impulse or constant struggle between those with this sort of democratic impulse and this uh, hierarchical impulse. And to me, that, that's, that, that's the future. There is no point at which, you know, some socialist revolution occurs and history ends. It's, it's constantly going to be a struggle. Between yes, can I, I wanna, Could we I understand wanna... the French Revolution in terms of personality types? It's a good question, and no, we can't. I don't think, and here's why. You're dealing in the French Revolution, at, same with the Russian Revolution, same with uh, most revolutions, Cuba. You had a situation there where people didn't have enough food to eat, right? In, a, in our modern society, there, you know, we live in a society where people, where, where the poor people are fat. Right. So, you know, you're talking about uh, you're talking about motivations that are simply going to be different. In other words, yeah, we, we don't have we can't because food and lack of food, lack of shelter are drives that I would imagine I would claim, I guess, that those are going to be drives that would. What overpower more subtle personality differences. Um, so, sorry, go ahead. Doug. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead, Ashley. This is really, you're much more well equipped to, to fight this fight than I am. So, I mean, this is your whole terrain. So, but, but you know, but actually, up. you know, let, let me think about that for a second, though, because I kind of want to give you an argument here. Um, I don't know. You might be able, you know, I think you there there may be elements of the French Revolution that you could make an argument that personality had an influence. I don't know the history of the French Revolution quite well enough 
to give you an example without embarrassing myself, so I'm not going to do it. But well, I'm going to bet I'll, okay, I'm I'm gonna gonna that you could make some kind of an argument. Now, it would be really subtle, you know. Certainly, I wouldn't think the personality differences are going to explain most of it. But I think probably it played a, it plays a role. So, okay, I... I well, I want to talk to more specifically about something, some of the things you actually said in your article to kind of clarify this. So like, uh, Jonathan. No, 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 no. I'm going to say what I wanted to say then if you're going to move on. Okay. No, I'm not, not going to, we're not moving on, but, but oh, go okay. ahead. Say what you want to say. Cause this is, I'm returning to the main point. No, because hey, this kind of, the way that this kind of talking, it reminds me of when I was studying anthropology and you would read people in the late 19th century trying to des des describe why like some groups are not, suited some groups in the world the colonized were not suited to liberal society liberal civilization to be citizens not yet or at all depending on the kindness of the person and it was always this like highfalutin theorizing about some differences within the brain and maybe we could measure the skulls and all this sort of stuff there must be something about people you know there must be something about the individual that explains it and of course like 200 years of hindsight we look back and we go well actually no because if you uh, change things and even like IQ goes up over a long period of time across all all people all around the world this sort of thing that what it means to be human is incredibly pla I hate this word plastic <laughs> malleable changeable and I think when we root too much in like well there must be some individual differences here we are rationalizing something else that's going on. We are not rationalizing, we are irrationalizing something else that is going on. And it strikes me that we are democratizing. I'm not saying you're doing this, but this, this general kind of narrative, it tends to democratize what were um, discourses that were reserved just for the people who were not close enough to reason to be allowed within liberal democratic societies. So it's like, oh, the, this person of this race, they're, they're irrational. Women can't vote because they're closer to nature, because they're closer to their bodily functions. And men, men are rational. And instead of being like, hey, actually, all humanity, you can come into that. We're like, actually, nobody's rational. <laughs> the white man was not <laughs> rational. Nobody's, we just basically democratized what were incredibly oh. insulting things said about people. The reason why women could not be involved in, in uh, civil society was because they were close to nature. Now everybody's close to nature. Now now it's become progressive to say, oh, we're all just kind of animals. That's that's what gets my, like, my, yeah, like. Well, I, I can, I, can, I, can I follow up with another punch before you answer? That, you have to, you're going to have to punch. answer us both before before I want to throw something else in here, which is that, um, okay. So in the piece, you talk about Heights, um, theory about uh, yeah, moral Heights, values, Heights, moral. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he says, you know, um, there are like what, how many, six different moral categories and yeah. liberals privileged a couple of them m more than the others and, yeah. and conservatives, uh, privilege them all. Um, but it seems to me that these moral categories um, are interdependent. There, and there, that you get, there, there let there me are, just get there. to that. Let me get, let me get oh, sorry, to like the ahead. point here. It's like, so um, for instance, the div division between a conservative and, and a liberal, the liberal as we define it today, you know, like a, a, a left liberal um, would be concerned about equality and the conservative would be concerned about proportionality. So, you know, the, the left liberal wants everybody to be equal and the conservative wants to make sure that uh, you get back what you contribute to society to be that's that your your rewards are proportional to your contribution. But in in reality, the li left liberal um, wants things to be proportional. They they feel as though there are groups of people who are uh, not allowed to participate uh, fully and they, they do not get a, a, the proportion back from society that they either contribute or could contribute if they weren't oppressed. And the conservative um, requires equality uh, just to set up proportionality. If you, you know, you, there must be some sort of uh, equal uh, measure here between what's given and what's, and what's taken. Um, so equality and proportionality are, are both principles at work in both theories. I think the difference in emphasis 
has to do not so much with a uh, set personality type, but where you fit into the system based on these kinds of values. Where, where do you end up? Are you uh, in a city struggling for uh, a minimum wage job or a, or a high paying job? Are you out in the, the country working um, uh, on a farm or, or working in transportation? These things are going to shape which aspect of the values um, are most uh, significant to you. And I think they'll shape it in a rational way. I don't think that that's that the, the way that we um, that, that that's not some irrational choice we're making. It has to do with where how we actually fit into the, the world. OK, first, before I respond to that, let me just say to Ashley's question or comment about the uh, ideas treat people like animals which i would say yes i'm making a fundamental assumption that people are in fact animals and can be in some way studied like animals i'm definitely making that assumption um now to doug's question i think what you're saying i think hate himself would probably say that's an example of where you could use that information in the way you frame and message about leftist ideas. Uh, in other words, let me give you an example of the kind of, he, here's what he finds. Like if, if you give people, if you uh, give people written scenarios or so on and, and then ask them for their feedback, here's an example of the kind of thing that'll, that distinguishes left and right in the kinds of research that he does. All right. So, and this is an example I'm pretty sure hate uses. Take uh, welfare, you know, in the Amer American welfare system, right? Now, most people, most l people on the left, and, and I'm using left super loosely here, right? Mm. I'm just saying if we, you know, draw a line between left and right, all right, if you're on the left side, you're going to tend to see the American welfare system as something necessary because there are people who need it because they don't because for you know lots of reasons they are not able to adequately compete for resources in the economy and yada 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 so um the idea is that oh and then uh uh when the issue of like welfare fraud comes up right so okay well you know you've heard the, the You've heard conservatives talk about welfare mothers and yada, 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 and all that. So when those kinds of stories come up, your typical person on the left is going to say, well, okay, sure, there's going to be some fraud, but it's more important that these people who don't, you know, who, who don't have, for whatever reason, equal access to resources, it's more important that we give them these things, right? That far outweighs the fraud, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. A conservative, right, or someone on the right, the fraud is the most salient thing in that scenario to them. See, because the fraud, a, a, someone getting welfare funds that they don't deserve, right, mm -hmm. that's more salient. That's more emotionally triggering. That is, uh, and and that's you know, and you see, and you, you hear those attitudes between left mm -hmm. on welfare, right. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that, besides personality, which is one aspect of it, there's also cognitive issues, cognitive skill. This was one thing Lacoff talks about. I didn't put that in the article, but it's one of his big things. And I see this in my own work, and that's direct versus, direct versus systemic causation. Now, to make a democratized workplace work, and again, I'm not trying to argue that we don't have, shouldn't have a democratized workplace. I think we should, right? I really would like, I think that all three of our goals are probably super similar on that, right? Mm -hmm. We're just disagreeing on how does something like that can happen. All right, so. No, actually, I want the workplace to be run through the party and I want to be the head of the party. So well, everything goes through me. No, go ahead. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kidding. I'm here's, kidding. The, here's the thing with the democratized workplace thing, right? Instead of thinking like, okay, human beings are empirical. We live in the world. We confront its problems and we attempt to solve them as we live our lives. That's, that's what we do. 
Uh, and instead of thinking like, hey, maybe that's not a solution or that solution to the problem won't work, we're like, gosh, what is it about human beings that makes them not want this thing I want? Like we, you know, like maybe when people, if people don't want that, you might want to, this is me doing qualitative research instead of like mm -hmm. um, ticking boxes and that kind of thing, where I just think, well, if you actually ask people and talk to them, it's not like, oh, well, my lizard brain or something. And there's usually some kind of reason. That, people that, always that give you a reason. Rationalizing yeah. leaves out, sorry. No, people will always, I mean, people, people will always verbalize reasons for their behavior. Right. Right. But not only that, but to go back to your model of like a to, to question of like uh, the person who is um, more concerned about uh, welfare uh, queens cheating. Oh, yeah. Government, yeah. Right. Yeah. As opposed to someone who's more concerned about the poverty that creates the necessity for that. Well, you have to ask yourself, like, you know, what are the conditions that the person uh, who is more concerned about the welfare queens and their cheating, uh, wh what are they living with? What, why is it that these values of proportionality have the, uh, a certain power uh, in some places, in some communities with some people, more than the concerns about ec uh, fair play and, and equity well, um, uh, you know, at the outset? And I think it has to do with uh, I mean, I can't just quickly summarize why, but I think it has to do with um, the kinds of imperatives that arise in different sorts of communities and different kinds of work, um, more than it has to do with some innate structure in there. Well, you find these differences within these communities. That's the thing that would argue against that. In other words, and, and again, we're not talking about we're not talking about major influences on behavior necessarily. We're talking about subtle predispositions to think in certain ways. It's not that somebody can't learn to think a different way. It's, it's just that people are predisposed in different ways. People are predisposed to think differently. I'll give you another example. This is what I was going to talk about before. This is direct versus systemic causation. All right. Now in a democratized workplace, you're asking everyone, right? to take some role in, to take on some role in the management of the organization. Would that mm -hmm. be accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, here's the thing, like, uh, the, the, you know, the kind of workers co-op and in all seriousness, the kind of workers co-op democratized workplace approach that, um, Bhaskar talks about in his book, um, is just one, approach sure. to understanding what socialism would be. Um, and uh, I, I have, I have my reasons for being skeptical of that approach in the short term or as a, as a, as a medium step towards socialism. And here it is. Um, when I have been given the ability as an employee to help management make decisions and participate in the decision-making process as a, in a democratic way. One of the things that um, didn't change was that my ultimate relationship with uh, my employer as an employee, as someone had to rely on them for my living and who had to rely on the serving a certain kind of function uh, in order to continue having the job. So there was, it was a kind of false kind of participation. I think what Sankara is as asking for, it goes beyond the level of participation I was involved with. But mm -hmm. even so, I think that he would find that the democracy in the workplace wouldn't overcome some of the problems that are inherent to the way we produce and distribute the world now, the world of our own making now. So um, I, I think that the tr kinds of transformations that need to take place run deeper than what Sankara spells out in his book. Okay, um, so do I. but 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 nonetheless, you know, so when you're asking me to defend uh, the idea of workplace democracy and, uh, you know, what I would say is, well, again, I would say we can't presume that the workplace is this neutral ground, which doesn't have, in, you know, uh, internal structures that that push us in one direction or another um, and that and we can't assume that just democratic processes and organization within the workplace would be able to overcome those uh, in, in 
inequities, uh, disproportionalities, and a variety of other conflicts and problems that uh, arise from from the the structure of work. Um, so, uh, anyway, yeah, okay, so that makes sense. And, and again, I I think that well, let me talk about direct versus systemic causation. All right, now this is not something that's necessarily personality trait related in the way that say. Um, uh, hates, you know, stuff is. And this comes from uh, Lakoff. So some people have the propensity to think in terms of systemic causation. Some people think in terms of direct causation and struggle with systemic causation. You can give people tests and you can see this, right? Now, People who struggle with systemic causation tend to be right wing and they tend to be in particular people who will say uh, who, who believe who think global warming is a hoax, uh, who look for simple solutions like, you know, building the wall. Global warming is a good example. All right. Like, like I'm going to guess. Right. Everyone here. Is quite comfortable thinking in terms of systemic causation, because that's what everyone here does, right? They try Not to- Not really, I've been looking at the, the comments and I'm gonna, anyway, sorry. Well, no, wait, no, let's say what- what, what, well, good. what I, I'm hoping it makes make some people angry. <laughs> Did I? No, no. no. Uh, no. Um, people are Ten saying- years ago, <laughs> God damn it. People would, got, would be pissed if I was saying this. All right, anyway. Go, yeah, go ahead, finish okay. off. And then we're gonna jump into the parrot room. We've okay. got another- all right, all right. Do you so, have time well, for that, Ashley? If not, I'm going to accuse. I'm going to. I'm going to drop an f bomb. Fascism. So just let me do that, and then we can go. Who are you going to? Who, who are you going to accuse of that? Not me. Not not no, me. No, it's, it's not, no. 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 You said. You said. Oh, and about five comments came up that said exactly the same thing, which was, I said, you have to actually talk to people, and you find out that there's some other issue that you weren't considering when you were like, hmm. Why do people not like my ideas? Must be because they're stupid. And then you, you like ask them and there's something else. And, and there was about five comments that came up that was like, yeah, but there's another reason. They're just rationalizing after the fact. And there's like, oh no, people don't, they're not rational. We just do post hoc rationalizations. Literally, Vilfredo Pareto. Literally, that's what Vilfredo Pareto says. He says, people are not rational and, and we already have everything decided in our heads and you can't convince anybody. And it's... Um, and, and, and that's just it. And when we think that we're, we're convinced, we're actually just rationalizing something that was already there. And it, it should give us pause that there is a lot of controversy about whether or not Pareto was a proto-fascist. He wrote to Mussolini um, favorably late in life, but he died before fascism became really a thing. Because when you, and I think the, there's a reason why there's a connection to his seeming... Um, um, affinity for fascism. And it's because when you, it, there's actually, it, it's not a small thing. There's a lot at stake here. When you are saying that human beings are irrational, you're throwing out so much. You're throwing out the whole idea that we, the, the, the basis of democracy, the basis of human rights, the, ba this, the it's based no, on I, the idea that you maybe. are as human a human right being, you have reason and you're capable of reflecting and therefore making a choice on the basis of something. And also it's the basis, I think, of a, Mar a positive vision, a Marxist vision of the future, which is that human beings can understand the world and therefore control it. That we are not, we are alienated from that, but in the future we are, we are alienated from our godlike nature, but in the future we can be gods, right? This is the end, this is the sublation of the long history of um, man projecting himself onto gods, realizing that actually this was just a project projection. Um, so man, God made man in his own image. No, no, man made God in his own image. And the next point when things are, when uh, the mode of production is mature enough, man is God. You can think it and you create it. That is the, through, through reason, through understanding. If you throw all of that out, you've thrown out the future, the, the positive future where we make the world on the basis of reason. There is a lot at stake. I know that's controversial, especially in the United States, which is really steeped in this whole psych, um, psychological imagination, but it is so important. Ashley, he's down, okay? You've got him, he's on the, he's on the mat. 
John, you just get up. I'm going to splash some water in your face. You can do it, champ. But but we're going to take you into the next round into the parrot room. Parrot room. Okay, okay. okay. I'll, and, recover. I'll see if I can recover in the parrot the room. Comments are going to hate me. I do yeah. feel. Yeah. All yeah, right, but um, I I'm enjoying this quite a lot. So uh, I'm going to run the little outro thing, and then uh, we'll see you guys in about 20 minutes in the parrot room. In the case of okay. nuclear or radiological fallout, people living around.